Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this Tuesday in June for one of our summer virtual impact series through the Talent Lab at FIU in Washington, DC. I am Eric Feldman, the Associate Director of FIU in Washington, DC. And you're here today for an event called Careers in Congress. Before we get rolling, officially and fully, I have a few uh, points of information about Congress and internships there and about our operations here at FIU and DC. And I see that um, some of you are starting to introduce yourselves and say good morning in the chat, which I was going to encourage. So feel free to, um, to, to say anything about yourself and, and uh, your interests in today's topic. As a point of professional development, I wanted to uh, say a bit about The Hill uh, because um, the FIU and DC team spends a lot of time on The Hill. All of our panelists work on The Hill. And every once in a while, I remember that, um, you know, uh, the students and others joining us from Miami that haven't been in DC yet might uh, not have the exact same understanding of, of, of what The Hill is uh, as us in DC. So I wanted to uh, share that because um, you'll hear that phrase uh, a lot. And we've actually called previous versions of this event Life on the Hill and, and things of that nature. So you've probably all seen or maybe even taken a tour of the main US Capitol building in the center there with uh, the very recognizable dome. Um, but the Hill, where all of the, uh, the members of Congress and their staffs work, consists of a, a larger complex of buildings surrounding the Capitol, which includes a house and Senate office buildings for those um, the members of those chambers respectively, as well as a variety of other buildings, including uh, several buildings of the Library of Congress, uh, the Visitor Center, the U.S. Botanic Garden. And uh, so that's what we mean when we refer to, refer to the hill. And then I kind of noticed uh, putting this on here, I added the, the red arrow just off the hill. FIU and DC is just down the street, right there indicated by, by that arrow. And so um, those of you on the call who might not have been able to visit FIU and DC in person yet, uh, you can be proud to know that your university has a strong presence very close to um, you know, where our nation's laws are made and all the great things you'll hear about today go on. And we look forward to having you up here at some point in the future. So what is FIU in DC? So this is your first engagement with us. Our team here in Washington uh, focuses on three main pillars. Those are solutions that is advocating directly with our members of Congress, especially but not limited to those from South Florida about making sure FIU's uh, research programs on important topics, including uh, water quality and Latin America policy, cybersecurity uh, are funded and supported and partnered with the federal government. And that includes student support initiatives as well. Um, the various uh, programs we have uh, to get students into college and to complete college Pell Grants and things of that nature. We work with our members of Congress to ensure partnership from the federal government on those things. Our idea exchange programming, our larger scale events that we have in DC under normal circumstances to bring together not only FIU researchers from Miami, but congressional staffs, uh, think tanks in DC, federal agency leaders to discuss um, important issues, including things like uh, uh, health disparities and brain health research, positioning our university, our FIU as a as a leader in conversations at the national level on these topics. And the Talent Lab is what you're experiencing today. The Talent Lab is everything that we do to prepare our students and alumni for careers and internships in the capital. And so since that's what this is all about, and many of you um, are pursuing those sorts of opportunities a little more in the Talent Lab, if you're not already familiar with the scope of, uh, of, of participation in the Talent Lab, about 100 students and recent grads every year do intern in Washington, D.C., and you learn a little bit more about how to do that today. And 500 more students come to D.C. every uh, year for fly-in seminars and other conferences. And even in the past few months, we've been able to do a lot of this virtually, uh, including having a fully virtual uh, fly-in. So our website, talentlab.fa.edu, has more information about how we support students doing internships, uh, what our flying seminar program is, the impact series is what you're attending right now online, as well as our brand new Hamilton Scholars program, uh, which you might be interested in for a future semester. We've currently selected a, our very first cohort of Hamilton Scholars for the, the fall semester, and there's more information about that on our site. Since we're talking about Congress specifically today, this is one area that our talent lab uh, has really stepped up to the plate to support FIU students in the uh, annual year that's really is ending uh, 
this week into the new the new annual year. So this was 2019-20. Um, at least 19 FIU students and recent grads interned in Congress. Many of those were with members of Congress, like our alumni on the chat today um, are working in, but also included other offices like the Library of Congress and the Government Accountability Office, which are part of, part of Congress, the legislative branch. And FIU and DC has provided $10,000 in scholarships in the past year to students interning in Congress. Um, so the more we get to know you, and get to know your passions and, and, and why working in Congress would uh, support those things, the more we can direct uh, some resources your way as well to our current students. I'm going to be talking a lot about ways to prepare for Congress and you're going to be hearing from our, our panelists and the, the main thing I want to impart to you is make sure that our team here in DC and my, myself specifically, that's my email address there, ericf at fiu.edu, are a partner in your research and your application process. Um, all 535 members of Congress have some information on their websites about their internship requirements and deadlines and the specific things they're looking for. So that's great to do some uh, initial research there and to ultimately apply through there. But let our team know uh, what your thoughts are. We can uh, you know, help you determine some members that are best aligned to your interests and help you with your application materials and let our uh, partners uh, in those offices like the ones on the call today um, participate in that process of preparing you. And uh, uh, an external resource that I do highly recommend, it's not always free, but it's free for about one more month. College to Congress, a nonprofit up here, has launched an online course about how to apply to congressional internships and be successful in them. You can access that at c2cuniversity.com. And I highly recommend anyone who feels compelled to pursue a professional internship after this morning to, to complete that entire course and get the certification at the end of it, while also keeping me appraised of, of what you're learning and how our team can help you um, in that process. It also seemed relevant to let you know about the, the, the scope of FIU's uh, connections and impact on Capitol Hill. The, the map you see here is a not even complete list of offices that FIU alumni have interned and or worked full time at. So you can see while there's, uh, makes sense, there's a large uh, concentration in our home state of Florida, our students and alumni have gone to work around, uh, in DC for offices representing uh, around the country. And of this list, five of our alumni that work on Capitol Hill are chiefs of staff for the members of Congress, which is the, the highest ranking um, uh, congressional staff position. Um, I'm happy to introduce today's panel that we'll be hearing from very, very shortly. Uh, today we have uh, three alumni who work uh, on Capitol Hill. Laura Hernandez is the press secretary for Representative Mario diaz Uh Her previous roles in Congress were also with, uh, with the same congressman, diaz Villart. At FIU, she was involved in Greek Life, the peer mentor program, student broadcast organization, and she has a second degree, graduate degree from FIU as well, and a master's of public administration. Anya Martinez is a staff assistant for Representative uh, Debbie Murkasel Powell. She is formerly uh, interned for uh, Donna Shalala, also uh, of South Florida, and we have one of uh, her staff members on the call as well. At FIU, she, she worked for the Moss School of Construction, and uh, uh, since she was recently an intern, she was heavily involved in, in the FIU and DC Talent Lab programs, like the one that you're in today um, as a as a student. And Christopher Horta is a legislative assistant for Representative Donna Shalala. He's worked for some uh, former members of Congress, including uh, Joseph Crowley of New York and Xavier Becerra of California. The, is the portfolios of issues that he handles for Representative Shalala include, uh, but are not limited to, education, military and defense, housing, and homeland security. At FIU, he was involved in organizations like Model UN, which is a fantastic pipeline to, to, to the Hill, UNICEF, UNICEF and the College Democrats. I also want to say a quick hello to um, someone on the call uh, that is not a panelist per se, but maybe we'll hear from and we're glad to have her here either way. Hannah Vargas is joining uh, on the call because she's a board member of the um, Congressional Hispanic Staff Association or CHASA and, and Christopher and, and the other two members might be as well, I'm not too sure, are, are, uh, is, a, is a staff association that helps promote diversity and inclusion on the Hill. Uh, we wanted to make sure to hear about that, uh, those types of organizations from our panelists, uh, but also glad to have a, a board member of one of those organizations uh, on the call uh, with us. Quick plug for something happening right after this, if you're down for two Zoom events in a row, uh, I'm excited enough about this one to, to do it. 
um, our partners at Florida House, a nonprofit organization, so they're hosting this, but we are one of the sponsors of it. Um, Tom Bowman, NPR's a Pentagon reporter, uh, starting right at noon at a, at a, on, a, on a Zoom event hosted by our partners there. I'll paste this Zoom meeting ID and password into the um, chat once I'm done introducing and have some uh, copy and paste uh, de dexterity, but uh, anyone on this call is more than welcome if you're an NPR file like I am to, to join that and to, to meet Mr. Bowman. So hope to see some of you there as well. So many of you have been already introducing yourself. Uh, feel free if you haven't already to let us know your affiliation with FIU, current student, graduate, et cetera, why you're here today. I'd be curious to, to know and to make sure everyone leaves this call if you don't know, knowing who your member of Congress is. So share with that if you do know and want to share. But I'll also post the link on the uh, house.gov page to look up your member of Congress because if you're on this call and don't know uh, who that is, uh, you should um, uh, leave here knowing that. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator shortly. The moderator, uh, Gabriella, has some questions for our, our um, panelists. Um, but you can ask questions anytime into the chat. As you ask questions near the end of the program, Gabriella will either call on you to ask your question um, via video, or if there are several questions that are, that are similar, she might synthesize those into one question to uh, ask our panelists. So without further ado, the only thing I want to do before starting with our panelists is our moderator today, who is Gabriela Hernandez from the uh, Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. She's an FIU alumna herself, and the WSCC is the official federal government celebration of 100 years of the women's right to vote. So I would like her to say just a little bit about how to get involved and what's going on in your state and what that commission is um, before uh, the year 2020 uh, is over. And from there, she's going to go ahead and take it away and uh, start a conversation with our panelists. Gabriela. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being with us today. I'm really excited for this panel. Um, just a little bit about me before we get started. I'm a spring 2019 alum from FIU, so fairly recent. Um, I'm currently the program coordinator for the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. And that's a really long name, so just so that everyone has a little bit of a background. Um, a commission is a small federal agency. In our case, we are just a staff of six wonderful women. Um, and basically, our commission was created in 2017 through legislation by Congress. And it has the sole purpose of commemorating and celebrating the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and overall women's right to vote. Um, I don't want to go on too much about the commission, but if you would like to learn more about what's happening in your state and some wonderful programs that we're especially holding in August for this commemoration, I encourage you to visit our website. You can visit it at womensvote100.org and you can learn about all of the content we're creating, events that we're holding, and just some more suffrage information that maybe you didn't know about. So highly encourage visiting our website. So I actually would want to get started with our panel right now. Um, thank you panelists for being here, of course. So I want to get started by maybe you guys giving us a little bit of a description of what your jobs currently are, just so that everyone's a little bit familiar with what your titles actually mean. So why don't we start out with this. So each of you hold a different position in your office. We have a press secretary, we have a staff assistant, we have a legislative assistant. Could you each share maybe a little bit about your role and how your roles interact within each office? So why don't we start with Anya? Anya, would you like to start us off? Absolutely, thank you, Gabriela, and thank you, Eric, Carlos, FIU, and DC for hosting this. Um, I think this is a great opportunity for a lot of students and alumni to get to know more about what us staffers on the Hill do. Christopher, nice to see you. Um, <laughs> I, Christopher is a colleague of mine when I was an intern at Congresswoman Donna Shalala's office. So, and I worked closely with Christopher, so really nice seeing him. Um, as a staff assistant for Congresswoman Carcel Powell, a lot of what I do is, my main roles are the, as an intern coordinator, I oversee the internship program here in DC. So feel free to apply to our program through our website. That's mucarcel powellhousegovernor um, I am also the tour coordinator and the flag coordinator. So essentially what that means is that I oversee the tour programs in our office as well as the flag requests in our office. Uh, some of my other responsibilities are overseeing the day-to-day um, -day operations in the office. A lot of, so to say, um, like admin work. 
I do a lot of collaborative work with the legislative team as well because I do want to concentrate more on a legislative position. So I do their tracking as well. And that's essentially a really quick rundown of what I do. Got it. I'm sure there's so much more that you do, um, but that's great. Thank you so much. Christopher, would you want to give a little bit about what you do in your office? Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, first, thanks everyone for having me. Thanks, Carlos, Gabriela, Eric. Uh, I think this is great, not just for our school, but especially for FIU and, and DC and uh, you know, Hispanic students all, all, all over the hill. Uh, Anya, Anya definitely spoke a little bit on sort of the legislative track and working with junior staff on on sort of pushing forward our members' legislative agenda. Um, my main responsibility center around advising my boss, Congresswoman Shalala, on a, a legislative docket of issues uh, varies per member. For example, my boss is on the Education and Labor Committee and on polls. So that sort of gives you a direction for what's going to be top priority. Um, and in that sense, education is probably the number one biggest issue by virtue of her being in the committee. So in terms of advising, there's a lot of taking meetings with stakeholders, taking meetings with different groups that are, are sort of lobbying or discussing um, their interest in an issue or changes they would like to see in an issue. Um, with other offices, having meetings, having discussions on legislation, um, working with my member, other offices and, and uh, outside groups to sort of coalesce around an idea and maybe the solution is legislation or having a, um, a, a shift in, in discussion so we can maybe highlight a specific portion of an issue. Um, and a lot of writing, you know, a lot of memo writing, a lot of bill descriptions, um, a lot of ex email exchanges with Ledge Council, with other offices, with experts on, on a specific issue topic. For example, I'm very much a generalist, right? So my boss is on the education committee, but I cover about 12 or 13 different issues. So it's, it's almost impossible to become an expert in one of them. Uh, my boss is very interested in defense and housing policy, but she's not in either of the committees, committees of jurisdiction. So it's sort of my responsibility to, as a member not in the committee, to craft some kind of policy or legislative agenda that we can then put forward and advocate on behalf of so whether it's increased funding or changes in, in regulation or increase in regulation or making changes in other programs or run um all, all those things sort of form the, the, uh, the crafting of my day um and yeah it, a lot of writing I'll, I'll, I'll leave it with there's just a lot of writing and a lot of meetings um on dozens and dozens of issues all right, thank you so much, Christopher. And that's actually a great point that you brought up. Something that I was really surprised by when I first got to DC was how much each of the staff of these Congress members actually work on. So like, as you said, there's not just one legislative assistant per issue, it's several issues for one legislative assistant, which is why your workload is so heavy. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Laura, would you wanna finish us off with this question? Talk, talk about um, a little bit about what you do in your office. Yes, of course. And just to piggyback off of what Anya and Christopher said earlier, this is such an amazing thing that FIU and DC is hosting. And I wish that when I was at FIU, I would have known about opportunities like this because I think my overall experience would have gone a little bit uh, smoother. Um, but as press secretary, um, for a bit of background information, um, every office has a different dynamic in terms of their communications team. So some offices have a communications director, a press secretary, somebody in charge of digital media, um, and other offices just have one person doing kind of a little bit of everything, and that would be me as press secretary. So I'm in charge of doing press releases, um, of handling the members' social media accounts, sending out tweets on his behalf, uh, coordinating interviews with local and national media, coordinating press conferences, um, and just every, every time there's a breaking news or something that happened that is of interest to the congressman, usually the reporters will reach out for a statement and then I'm in charge of preparing that statement. Um, and I work hand in hand with the Anyas and the Christophers of my office, the legislative staff, because I'm one person, so I'm not familiar with every single topic. Um, so it's my, for example, when I have to write a press release on something I'm not 
necessarily familiar with or a bill that's going to be up for vote, I work with my legislative team in terms of how is the congressman going to vote on it? What angle are we going to take on the issue? And what's the overall tone that we want to give the, the press release? So it's definitely a lot of teamwork. So any job on the Hill, I would say any position requires an extreme amount of teamwork and just being a team player overall, but it's an amazing experience and I would recommend it to each and every one of you. All right, thank you so much, Laura. Yeah, I mean, the Hill, I know from at least viewing it from the outside, it's a very fast paced world. So I think you're completely right that you really do depend on your counterparts, whether inside of the office or outside. So great point. Um, I actually think that this might be a popular question with some people. Um, I want to talk a little bit about how each of you got to your position. You know, I'm sure that your journeys have all been very different and, you know, very long. And but I want to talk a little bit about how you found your position or how you found the road to get there. So maybe talk a little bit about how you found your position. Was it through the alumni network? Was it through a program like FIU in DC, an internship, a fellowship? Kind of talk a little bit about your journey so that maybe people can see that reflection in themselves and maybe you know find their own way to similar positions as yours. Um, Christopher, would you want to start us off maybe? Yeah, sure. So I interned in DC uh, my junior year of college at a nonprofit called the Robert F. Kennedy Human Rights Center, and they did a lot more sort of international relations in the Caribbean, Latin America, lots of Haiti, Dominican Republic, bilateral relations, uh, Honduras and Guatemala, which wasn't necessarily my area of either expertise of, or study when I was in college. I'm a history major, and I uh, and specifically European history major, which is what my degree was in. So I wasn't as um, sort of well-versed in that specific section of the world, but I got, I got an internship at a really good organization where I got to you know, practice a lot of writing, assisting with a lot of events here in DC. And then that transition into getting an internship the next, the next summer, which was with Frederica Wilson, a congresswoman from Miami as well. So she's very active in Haiti and Dominican relation and Dominican Republic relations. So uh, my former internship held an event, the congresswoman attended, I was able to meet her staff. And then we sort of created that open level of communication where I showed interest in, in, a, in an additional internship and moved up to DC, interned uh, my senior year with um, Congresswoman Wilson, and then sort of went that trajectory of, the, you know, your regular Hill, um, upward structure where you intern, you become a staff assistant, then you get some kind of junior mid-level uh, position. I always wanted to do legislation, so I, I was lucky enough to work with offices. And when you're an intern or a staff assistant, you sort of get, at times, the short end of the stick because you don't always get to work on what you want on a lot of issues. But the willingness, and if you're just trying to, you know, put a good face, show that you're a good worker, you take what you can get and you, you know, you muscle through it. Um, I was able to work with Frederick that allowed me to have a lot of one-on-one -on -one with legislative staff as an intern. And, and then when I got hired with Becerra as a staff assistant, it was sort of a tenured track to work with the LEDGE team. So I was able to build a, a sort of minimal small portfolio on military, homeland security, defense issues, because that's sort of the, the staff team, staffing team that I was assigned to. And it, it, it built on that legislative experience to you know, know how to craft a bill, know how to work on an amendment, know how to engage with other offices for who's sort of leading, who's the, who's the main focal point on a specific issue and work with them since they're sort of the lead on it, Congress-wide on, on both sides of the aisle. And, and then you build your resume based on those, uh, on those specifics to then try to get a, a more senior position. Um, so then I moved, I moved up from, you know, intern, staff assistant, then I became a policy assistant, uh, and then I got my title as an LA for Congresswoman. Um, my route is a little bit different though. I did, although I went the traditional upward steps of junior staff to now uh, legislative assistant, um, I, I only have ever really worked for uh, leadership offices. So the structure isn't as sort of member or constituent heavy. For example, I, as a legislative assistant for Shalala, I, my focus is her, right? My focus is putting forward her priorities, uh, working for members that were within leadership. So Becerra and Crowley were both chair, chairman of the Democratic Caucus, which meant they had a lot more, a bigger budget for staff. So there was a lot more um, 
member specific uh, um, support system. So we had maybe 30, 40 members in the Democratic Caucus that we were tasked with assisting. And that's assisting with helping them with amendments, making sure that they have sort of the resources they need to introduce bills, to put out a, a message on an issue so their constituents can understand it. Um, a lot more umbrella topic than member specific. So it was sort of tough to craft a, an issue specific um, position on anything because we were trying to stay more broad, uh, broadly speaking on, a, on a, wider, a wider understandable position on issues. And that allowed me to just learn a lot more and become sort of more of a generalist. Um, so then that was the same thing with Sarah with Crowley and moving up from members that are unfortunately either lost or retired, uh, which is a little bit stressful at times, but you get the hang of being on the hill. Uh, it, it just it gives you a lot of experience. And then you can just move up the ladder by working for different members with different experiences, with different positions. And I think that's ultimately what probably makes a good staffer, you know, gets you a lot of experience. Got it, thank you. I mean, it sounds like keeping an open mind and staying flexible are definitely yeah. a key when you're looking to work on the Hill. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, Laura, would you wanna tell us a little bit about your journey on the Hill and what that looked like? Yes, of course. So mine was also a little bit different in terms that I started interning for Congressman Mario diaz Balart when I was an FIU student, when I was doing my undergrad. In, I did my undergrad in broadcast journalism, so I was a student, um, a BBC student, uh, but I decided to intern for Congressman diaz Balart just to kind of get an experience of what it's like to work in a political office and just broaden my horizons a bit more. So I entered for him in his Doral office, which is, unlike Chris, it's all constituent based. Um, it's casework, it's helping constituents contact federal agencies. Um, so I started there and I interned for about five months. And um, again, it was answering the phones, uh, guiding constituents who maybe didn't know of specific resources or, or what to do to solve their, their federal issues. Um, and then after my internship ended, about two months after a position opened up in the congressman's office and I was called um, and they offered me the position as a staff assistant. So I was a staff assistant at his office for about a year. Um, and my job basically was answering the phones, um, responding to constituent emails, um, making sure that any inquiries we got through the website that pertained to casework that we were reaching out to the constituent in a timely manner, um, drafting letters and administrative work, but all constituent based. So I did, did that for about a year and then I was promoted to congressional aid which is, in other words, it's like a caseworker job. So my duties went from answering the phones to actually interviewing constituents that were going into the office seeking assistance um, and contacting the federal agency on their behalf and just being the liaison between the constituent and the federal agency and trying to resolve their issue. And as you guys may know already, um, in, the, in Miami specifically and in the district that the congressman represents, a big uh, amount of the case workload is immigration related. People who want the status of their residency application or people who have applied for citizenship and haven't received a response or somebody who whose social security benefits have been terminated. So our job was to basically find a solution to their problem um, or guide them in the right direction if we were able to. Um, and I did that job for about a year also, a year and a few months. And then the congressman called me one day and he offered me the position as press secretary in Washington, D.C. because our communications director, who had been with us for about eight years, um, she had found another job. And the congressman did know that I had a background in communications. So he he's very, um, he's an advocate for promoting from within. So a lot of our staff that we have, have all started off as interns. And two of us in the DC office have actually come up from the district office because um, we worked for him and then we've been just offered a position up here. Um, so when he called me, it was definitely, um, I wasn't expecting it, but it was the best. I mean, I was super happy. I took the position right away. I didn't have much experience in the communications field. Um, I did study it, but I hadn't practiced it per se because my jobs had been more uh, constituent based. Um, but I started about a year and some months ago, and um, it, it was just, it came natural to me, and um, 
this is what I was meant to do, in my opinion. So um, it was the perfect transition. And I would definitely say that for any position on the Hill, interning is the best way to find out if that's what you want to do, what issues you would be interested in handling or, or anything. I didn't know the role of congressional offices before I entered for a member of Congress. I didn't know that they could do so much for us for free and people would often contact our office and we would help them and they would ask how much should we owe you guys a lot of people especially in the community that we live in that it's a lot of immigrants we don't know that because we don't have that they don't have that back where they're from so interning and it, it's the perfect way to to get exposed and to see what you really want to do and, and to get a job on the hill ultimately love that you mentioned that at the end, Laura. It's that especially I think in our community, we don't know how accessible these people actually are and the fact that they work in the house of the people. So we elect them to be there and they work for us. And I think that's something that we forget because we see these, especially in DC, when I first got there, I saw these big buildings and these big office doors and it's kind of, it's intimidating because you say, oh, I, I security, oh, I can't go in there. I'm not allowed in there. The fact is, is that you can walk into any office building, you can knock on your representative's door, you can come in and you can talk to someone sitting at the front desk, you can ask for things. And I think that letting people know that they are accessible and they are there to help their community members is so important. So thank you so much for mentioning that. Uh, Anya, would you want to mention a little bit about how you got to your current position? Absolutely. Um, I really appreciate what the panelists said. Um, Definitely. There's a reason why we're called public servants and we're here to serve the public. We're here to serve our constituents. And absolutely, it's, it's a, not a lot of people know that we're here to help and offer that assistance. And a lot of people have this misconception that, you know, we're untouchable or whatever they might think, but we're not, we're here to help. So, um, so my, my transition happened very quickly on a more a lot of people from intern to staff assistant it does take some time as christopher and laura mentioned but um it all happened very quickly for me my per my journey is more from a personal experience um like christopher and laura i did get i did start off as an fiu student with my internship and how I got there was from a personal journey. I am a cancer survivor. So I was invited to a healthcare round table with the Congress, Congresswoman Shalala. And I was invited to tell my story because as you guys know, the Congresswoman is very vocal about healthcare and coming from a place where I was very privileged to have a mother who is with us now. So hi mom. <laughs> um she has health insurance and i was able to receive my treatment through um her employer based which is fiu healthcare um but with that it came it came its troubles regardless and i really appreciated or i still appreciate how vocal the congresswoman is on healthcare and i was invited at the round table and i was able to tell my story and then i realized that you know, this is what I'm passionate about and this is what I want to do. So I applied for the internship and then I got word that I received it. So I was very excited to start. Um, I began in January as an intern and March came along and I had reached out to the person who formerly had my position for a coffee. And I wanted to learn more about what a staff assistant does on the Hill apart from um, Claudio, who's the staff assistant at Congresswoman Shalala's office. I wanted to learn more from a different perspective. I just wanted more information. And during that coffee, she informed me that her position was opening up and it just, for lack of better words, the stars aligned and I applied. I sent over my resume. And again, I have to dedicate a lot of my um, experience to the mentors that I had in my internship office, Christopher being one of them, 
um, Carlos, the comms director. I also got to learn a little bit about comms. So honestly, it's no one ever does it alone. There's always someone who's there to push you and always someone there to help you. So no one ever gets to where they are alone. And a lot of that, um, not only professionally, but from my personal experience that has given me drive to continue going. And um, it's, for me, it's been absolutely amazing. I've had this position for the last three months, so I'm relatively new. And I really want to let everyone know that it is possible and we are here to help you outside of a constituent services realm we are here to offer information on how you can advance in your careers. So you choose if you want to work on the Hill and it is possible, but absolutely it does start at an internship. The experience that you gain in an internship is invaluable. You learn everything between comms to legislative roles and you learn overall how the Hill works and having that experience gets you further down the line on where you want to go. So absolutely. All right. Thank you, Anya. Thank you for sharing that personal part of your story. And I think that the three of you sharing that it shows how different everybody's journey is, even though you technically all work on the Hill, you work in the same place. So I think that it shows that no matter how unique your story is, there's still that opportunity for you to get there. Um, and now that we've been mentioning internships a lot, I want to bring this up because I think that for, for anyone, diversity on the Hill. Major, major, major conversation that I think we need to have because if we don't have representation on the Hill of what the actual American population looks like, the actual Miami population looks like, what can we expect for our laws? What can we expect for the actual written legislation that represents us, right? So I want to talk a little bit about maybe your journeys within the Hill and uh, diversity obstacles that you've encountered your own experiences, and maybe if you've noticed how groups such as CHASA or CHCI, maybe unpaid internships versus paid internships, have you seen any of these groups impact the diversity that you see on the Hill? Um, maybe any personal experiences as well when it comes to diversity on the Hill? Um, I'll, and I'll let you guys raise your hand, our panelists, if, if any of you want to specifically answer that question right now. I can uh, just provide some comments. I think a great way to, uh, I, I do think the Hill is a very diverse place, mainly because congressional offices, or at least my congressional office, we often like to, when we're hiring interns, we like to hire people who are our constituents or who live in our district or go to school in our district, which makes a huge difference because the district, for example, that Congressman diaz Ballard represents is not necessarily the same district as another member of Congress. The, the population is completely different. For example, he, his jurisdiction includes Doral, it includes Hialeah, it includes Miami Lakes, um, Miami Springs. Those are areas that are very Hispanic. Um, a lot of Hispanics live there. So a lot of our interns are Spanish speaking. Um, they are either from Central America, South America, from the Caribbean. Um, so that's a good way. And again, a lot of the interns do come on to, to be staff at one point, whether it be for our office or for another office. So that's a good way to maintain the diversity because you're always gonna have people who can relate to your constituents at the end of the day. So I really do think that's a great way to maintain the diversity altogether on the Hill. All right, thank you, Ani. I saw that you unmuted, you wanna go ahead? Absolutely. Um, going off of what Laura said, we, since I've taken on this position, I have really strived and our office in general has strived to, we are a very diverse office to begin with. Um, and I'm really happy to actually say that we have two Panthers on our internship team. One of them, Carlos, who's on this call. So quick little shout out to Carlos. And then also Gabriela is a, was, is a graduate, or yes, graduate student. She has her MPA. So absolutely, we, as you know, Congresswoman Crystal Powell represents the FIU main campus, which falls within her district. So we are always happy to take on FIU students, but we're also very happy. We have a very diverse um, 
district. It's a large minority, large um, Hispanic population in our district. So absolutely, we very much love to, and we also represent Monroe County. So we're very happy to have interns from the district or who are from the district um, because in our district office, they hire locally as well. And so do we, for the most part, we have intern. Right now we have an intern that's from Tavernier. So we definitely like to have diversity on our team because like Laura said, they understand the needs of our district. They understand the diverse population and they have, they speak the language as well. So they can, you know, they show compassion. They are passionate about what they do. So absolutely being diverse um, and having that Hispanic presence, at least for us is very important. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say our three offices are obviously maybe the, not the rule, the exception. We're from heavily Hispanic districts. All of us have, you know, Hispanic relatives. We speak Spanish. We, we interact with the culture. With We know what our districts are like. Um, I mean, I remember as a staff assistant, when I was in Anya's position, I was also in a capacity to hire interns. And hiring interns for a leadership office requires not the five, six, or seven that you typically get for a semester, but upwards of 20 or 25, because you're sort of allocating them per, you know, the personal office, the capital office, the, um, the, uh, lead, the leadership office, the WIP office. So you try to hire a large pool. And unfortunately, a, a big portion of those internships uh, are sort of left to kids of donors, you know, relatives of, of people that have made that connection with the member or have a previous relationship with the member. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of those tend to be upper middle class, wealthy, uh, predominantly white male interns. So I, I sort of took it within my capacity to elevate non-well-off, non-white, non-experienced interns to bring into the office. Um, if we were to just go, and this is an experience I had, I mean, every semester, if we were to go just personally on experience and who could afford to be in DC, we'd have a very homogeneous group of interns. So it, sort of tweaking that and, and allowing non-traditional students to come be included in the conversation uh, takes effort, right? Because if we just say we want the best, well, the best probably has experience working with legislation, where the best has experience with knowing how Congress works or knowing how to work in an office environment. And that's just not the reality for a lot of poor students. You know, they've, they don't know what DC is like. They don't know what an office setting is like. So they sort of need that assistance, that push to be included in the, in the discussions. And then, but, but that's just entry level, right? I think the bigger problem we see with diversity on the Hill is senior leadership uh, within offices, right? So chief of staffs, LDs, comms directors, um, deputy chiefs of staff, district directors, they tend to be white, they tend to be male, they tend to be, uh, have a lot of experience. So they, they, they sort of elevate, if, if you look at a pool of, of these specific positions, it's overwhelmingly one demographic. And those are the people that hire, right? Those are the people that hire people like me, hire people like Laura, the hire people like Anya. So if you have the people in power sort of meeting this one demographic mold, it's less likely that they'll hire from outside of that, unless they take the right steps and they say, you know what, we, we need a lot more diversity. We need a lot more people of color. We need a lot more people who don't come from traditional government legislative backgrounds to be included. And it'd be better if they were brown or if they were LGBT or if they were uh, from, different, from different walks of life, from, especially from low income uh, backgrounds. And we're getting better. We're definitely getting better. There's no denying that Congress is getting better. Um, but it, it's gonna, I think it's gonna take a lot more of an asserted effort to elevate diversity, especially for senior positions. I mean, I, I, I don't know what the percentage of black chiefs of staffs are, but I wouldn't, outside of, of black members of Congress, which is already not a huge amount of, uh, of members, um, I, I don't see it as a high enough, as a high enough number. And those are the people that are gonna hire, you know, they're going to hire junior staff. They're going to hire mid, mid staff, and that's how you really get a lot more diversity in Congress. Great, thank you so much. Yeah, Anna, you want to add something? I really want to elevate what Chris said because my supervisor, my staff, is a Hispanic man. So 
these are people in positions of power that, or at least it, within the office, that can take that opportunity on someone like myself, who is a Latina, I'm Hispanic, and it's important that in senior level, senior level positions, we have that diversity because then they take chances on those who aren't, might not be so experienced. And within my role as staff assistant, I like to do that with the people who apply to internships in our office. Yeah, I, I could hire someone who is extremely experienced in the position, but I want to take a chance on someone who after all, it is an entry level position and I want them to gain that experience that they do not have. That is the point of an entry level position so that they come in and learn, they're here to learn. So if they come in knowing it all, what, what does that serve for someone who also, is also deserving of the position and needs that experience? So absolutely, that is the mentality I have as well when hiring interns because I'm in a position to give back and help. So I want to, and I'm a junior staffer, so I can only imagine what a more diverse senior level workforce would look like as well. That's a great point. I think that there's a lot that we can dig into on this topic. I think it's definitely a combination of more diverse, higher leadership, but also making sure that entry levels such as internships are accessible not only for people of color, but also people of different financial levels, and those intersect all the time, right? So if you have an internship, it's it's just going to be more open to somebody who's, because it's easy to say, oh, I went to Washington DC and I got an internship. That's a lot of money. How did you get there, right? There's a lot more that goes into that than just saying, go get this internship. And that's why I think it's so important that now Congress is, a lot of offices offer paid internships. And I think that's really important that people know that you have these opportunities available to you. And I definitely encourage, as Eric had said before, to visit representatives' websites, ask questions, send, email, send emails. Are your internships paid? If so, how can I apply? What are the requirements? And really digging into those opportunities because they do exist and Congress is now offering paid internships. Um, I do want to jump on to a little bit over here of, we actually have a question from Kelsey Goodspeed. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Um, and before we head over to Eric, her question is, what kind of mentorship or guidance was offered during your first internship? Were you on your own? Did you have a direct staff, men a direct staff mentor or was it more peer mentorship and team based? Uh, do we have any of the panelists that want to jump on any mentorship and guidance that was offered to you during your first time? I can go after Anya. Anya, do you want to start and then I'll go after you? Yeah, I, I want to be able to offer that more um, fresh perspective since I was just an intern. Um, I would say that a lot of the mentorship and the guidance that I had within the office was team based. The interns worked together, but there was that open door policy within Congresswoman Jaleilo's office. And I worked with Chris. Chris would reach out to me. I would reach out to him. So a lot of it has to do with initiative as well. If the intern steps up and wants to learn and is committed and passionate, then when you show that, the team becomes interested as well because they already they're already passionate people in what they do and extremely busy at that. So when you reach out and you make that known, they want to work with you. So I would argue that it's very team based. If you happen to develop a more personal um, relationship with that person, then it could become a peer mentor one, but absolutely team-based. That is, you learn overall. Thank you. Laura, do you wanna go ahead and then we'll pass it off to Eric? Yes, so I agree with Anya in the, um, with regards to it being team-based. It definitely is because in the beginning, um, basically every member of the staff is asking for your assistance. So you do um, deal a lot with everybody working in the office, but I also do agree that it has a lot to do with initiative because when I was an intern specifically, I was very interested in immigration and how immigration worked and the whole process of, um, of applying for a legal status benefit. Um, so I became particularly close with, um, her name is Giselle Reynolds. She also graduated from FIU and she also did her master's um, in public administration at FIU as well. We became very close during my internship because she had worked or she still works for the congressman 
and she's been there for over 15 years. So her experience, she's dealt with every case basically that there was to know. So we became exceptionally close and she became my mentor at one point. And when it came to the hiring process, when, in a, when a staff assistant position opened up in the congressman's office, she thought of me because we had built that relationship and she, it was fresh in her mind. So um, I got hired after, you know, I got hired in the congressman's office and then a year or two later, Giselle went on to work in our Washington DC office and um, I'm working in the Washington DC office now as well. So I've kind of like followed in her footsteps, but that um, relationship and that professional um, friendship developed in my internship years because I would just, again, it was like an open door policy and I would just go to her office and ask her specific questions. I would ask to have lunch with her um, and everybody was always very welcoming. So that definitely was super helpful when it came to um, being able to grow from within in, in the congressman's office. Gabriela, if I could just add, uh, Laura said something key there, it's building relationships and setting yourself apart. Think of yourself, if you get one of these internships on the Hill, you're probably going to be in an office with five, six, seven interns. Like what sets you apart, right? What are you going to work on with maybe ledge staff or you're working more closely with your staff assistant? How do you make their life easier? How do you streamline their processes? How do you, how do you just keep like a, a comfort level of conversation, engaging in, in things they're interested in? So then they look to you when they need something. And, and that's how you build sort of that bridge, right? And then they can help you get a job and then they can help you be a reference. Um, and they can know we get experience and that's how you move up. You know, building those relationships is, is key and definitely setting yourself apart. Thank you so much. I mean, all, all appropriate, all completely. I mean, thank you. Thank you. Really just, I think this helps a lot. Um, I think right now we want to pass it over to Eric, but thank you so much for our panelists. Thank you for having this conversation with me and thank you. I love seeing so many FIU faces and names. It's so refreshing as we're in quarantine to feel like we're kind of on campus. But yeah, thank you so much for everyone being here. And Eric, I'll hand it off to you. Yeah, thank, thanks, Gabrielle. Amazing job leading this discussion. Um, I want to, before I go to some of my stuff, actually, uh, uh, Carlos, who I believe is uh, Anya's uh, intern, asked a, asked a really good question. And I know um, Carlos, my boss, Carlos, has uh, an interesting question or thought. So I'm going to kind of pose them together to see if uh, uh, the panelists have a reaction to either thing. Not all three of you have to go if you if you don't have something or want to. But what happens if you are working for a congressional office and your member loses re-election? What are your next steps as a staff member? And for both internships and jobs, what is the importance of applying to an office where you kind of agree with the member's policy uh, or political party, more or less? Does anybody else want to go first? If not, I can say sure. I'll, I'll say this, because I i don't know if you guys have either Laura or Anya have been sort of dealing with a member losing, but I've dealt with a member losing and a member retiring. And although both different circumstances, I still needed to find a job on both sides of the, of, of, at the end of their tenure. And it, it's, it's sort of casting a wide net. Um, you, you, you bargain with yourself, right? So maybe the member is not going to be so ideologically linked up with you but it might vary per experience right because as a staff assistant i think you're still building experience where you don't really necessarily care if a member is 100 percent ideologically aligned with you um uh but casting a wide net you know applying everywhere sitting down for coffees meeting with people that have the job that you want and then working on on changing resumes, cover letters, writing samples, um, talking to people that have either been in the previous experience or hiring and see what what takes, what they're looking for. They not they might not be the person hiring you, but they've done it before, they're doing it again this upcoming cycle. And it, just being the most prepared for where you go sit in an interview, you just run down the list for what they're looking for, as opposed to this well, this person was very similar to these other four candidates, but I don't know what really sets them apart. So it, it's a struggle at times because, you know, you're at the mercy of politics, right? If, you're, if your party loses a chamber, then there's going to be less seats for, for you to apply to, less members for you to apply to. Or if there's a big new majority or a party increases their majority, then you have a lot more options. We're lucky to live in a state with a large delegation. So it's sort of easy for us, right? If we want to stay within the state. 
I mean, I think we have 14 or 15 Republicans and like 12 or 13 Democrats. So that cast a wide net of saying, hey, Florida Network, Florida Chiefs, Florida LDs, um, Florida staffers, what advice do you have? Um, I'm interested in working for someone from the delegation. It creates sort of a good network to have. Um, and look, it's inevitably gonna happen. It's rare that you work for the same person for your entire life. It's really good for career development if you move around. Um, and it's inevitably going to happen. You know, people aren't on the Hill forever. So I, I, I would add that. I also do, going back to the building relationships part uh, that we've talked about, I also do think that's very important on the Hill. Um, it's very common for you to get coffees with people. So um, building that network when you're on the Hill with other offices and other people, for example, for me, it's a little bit different because I can just build that relationship with all the communication staffers um, and they do a very good job of holding meetings for all the communication staffers on the Hill and holding retreats, which is very helpful and you meeting new people. Um, but going the extra mile and reaching out to, I specifically have certain members of Congress that I see how their social media is handled and I, in a way, aspire to gain, be at that level of experience and have that. So I would reach out to their communication staff, to their comms director, or their digital um, director, just to grab a coffee, talk about what programs they use, uh, any advice that they have. That was very helpful for me also in the beginning when I started and I didn't have much experience in the comms field. It was very easy to just reach out and say like, how do I respond to certain requests um, from reporters? What do I do? Like building that relationship is certainly helpful at the end because if your member were to lose a reelection or retire, uh, once you have that connection established, it's much, much easier um, to get referred or for them to put in a good word for you if necessary um, in their office. So. I would really like to just reiterate what Christopher and Laura said. Um, it is about networking. It's about going out there, make, taking that initiative and reaching out and see it as a challenge. See it as, I want to work, I want to become better. And if you know that uh, that other person challenges you, reach out to them. Hey, I want to learn more from you. I want to learn X, Y, Z, how you do this. See it as an opportunity to learn. Don't feel threatened by that. See it as a challenge. I, I want to become better. I want to do my work better. So take that as an opportunity to learn from that person because that is how you grow as well. Coffees, you cannot, I'm guys, it is so important. You cannot deny the fact that sitting down and having a coffee with somebody is although it seems very simple, can bring you to a position that you wanted. So absolutely, cafecito. We <laughs> on the Hill, I, I know in Congressman Shaleda's office and in our office, we make Cuban cafecito. And if you guys are ever in DC, you're more than welcomed. I do make a killer coffee. So absolutely. I actually would love to add to that because I think that coffees are the best way to, to get in touch with people. But I think especially now in a pandemic, don't be afraid to email someone and say, hey, I want advice on my career. Can I sit down on a Zoom call with you? Can I sit down on a FaceTime with you? And you can still have that face-to-face -face connection, but maybe not go outside because we're not really allowed to do that right now. So just a little bit of a, of a suggestion there. Absolutely. All right, so before we close, I want to turn it quickly over to my colleague, Carlos Becerra, to thank our panelists and also point out in the chat that um, Hannah from the Congressional Hispanic Staff Association gave out her email. That staff association is really important to the topic of diversity on the Hill we've been talking about a little bit, and that's why I wanted to highlight that that group of uh, staff members uh, exists, and, uh, and Hannah is, uh, is willing to, to speak with interested students. Carlos? Yeah, well, thank you. Um, hope everyone can hear me. I definitely wanted to thank our, our panelists and Gabrielle as well for, for hosting us and, and our colleague from Chasa. Uh, there's an additional item I wanted to add and whether or not uh, these three can speak to this uh, on their work hours or not, there's, uh, let me just put it as advice to everyone. Uh, there's another way to get engaged uh, even before uh, looking for an internship. Uh, every member of Congress has to be reelected every two years. Uh, all politics is local. 
Uh, these are three examples. Uh, we will say that Congressman diaz Balart uh, recently just won by acclamation. Uh, he's been so successful that uh, uh, he was the only one on the ballot, so that's good. But both uh, Congresswoman Shalala and Marcus L. Powell are on the ballot this, uh, uh, this fall. And uh, as someone myself, let me just say it, uh, that has uh, gotten engaged in local campaigns, that's also an amazing learning experience of learning how these offices relate to and the uh, folks pursuing the offices relate to constituents and really understand the issues uh, that Laura even touched on and being a constituent uh, uh, services person earlier. So that's my uh, additional recommendation because um, in that way you can also meet a lot of their uh, more political teams and, and folks that are engaged and they're volunteer uh, for weekends knocking on doors. So that's the thing. I definitely want to thank uh, not only all three panelists, let me start with their bosses. Uh, we're fortunate to have an amazing uh, congressional delegation. Uh, for those of you that uh, some of, I see uh, many new faces and names, which is awesome. Uh, you'll get to know a little bit more about uh, what FIU uh, does in Washington, D.C. In addition to the amazing student programs that uh, Eric helps lead, uh, we're ourselves uh, advocating uh, for the university, our research programs, higher education, uh, etc. So I'm also uh, called, uh, I'm also one of those big bad lobbyists that has to uh, harass uh, and uh, reach out to each, each of these individuals to try to uh, get time with them often. Uh, but I'll start with their bosses. Um, Congressman diaz Ballard, um from his days as a state legislator and uh, representative uh, has his thumbprints on FIU's history. Uh, whether, you, you know, whether you look at our College of Law, whether you look at our expansion and growth, uh, from before it was popular, uh, he truly led the charge uh, to make sure FIU was getting its resources from Tallahassee, et cetera. And as a congressman, uh, he, is, uh, he and the entire team has given us amazing support. Um, Congresswoman Shalala and Marcus L. Powell, newer on the scene, but as I tell many of my colleagues from other universities, give me a three-time university president, a former health and human services secretary, and someone who's very politically savvy and keen and knows that we have over 50 plus thousand uh, FIU Panthers in her district. Uh, she has been amazing uh, to lead on many of our issues on the education committee. And Congressman Marcus L. Powell, just the same. Former FIU administrator, uh, really understands what we're doing in the healthcare space and on the environment. Uh, so that's, and then of course, these three individuals, they're the ones uh, that truly, let's just say it, we haven't said that this clearly, uh, members of our Congress are the elected officials, but the staff gets the work done. Uh, and Anya's the newest on the scene, but even in short time, she's been able to quickly uh, uh, help open doors for us, make sure we get information, uh, get meetings, et cetera. And in particular, one thing that has united these three offices in the recent, uh, in the last uh, year, and uh, especially in the COVID era, uh, our uh, CARES Act. I want to thank all three offices and all three individuals and their bosses because without uh, our congressional delegation support, uh, those important funds that have uh, funneled to FIU to help uh, directly uh, uh, support our students wouldn't have been possible. Uh, and of course, the, the one that's most recent, uh, but not new to any of these offices is DACA. Um, you all probably learned of uh, the Supreme Court's opinion last week, uh, all three offices. This is a, an issue that in Florida, thankfully, and in South Florida in particular, this is bipartisan. Uh, folks understand that this is important uh, for America, for innovation, for our economy, for these individual lives. Uh, special shout out, in, in, in particular on the Republican side, Congressman diaz Ballart has been a continued uh, leader and uh, in front of many of his other colleagues. So uh, if I can just underscore that, thanks. And I'm just going to drop in the link so everyone here understands a little bit more about FIU advocacy in DC, but uh, that's for you all and thank you all. Thank you, Carlos, for, 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 for that. And my own thank you to, to each of our panelists and our, our moderator. Uh, this was really great and we really appreciate not only this, but all the time you spend with students when we bring them up on flyings and similar programs. I just sent into the chat from my other account the information about our NPR Tom Bowman event. For those of you who do have the stamina for two things back to back and are interested in media. Um, and so I will see some of you there and uh, the rest of you at other future engagements. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for everything. Take care. Thank you.
Bye, guys. Bye, everyone.